clear is that it's, this is not going to be 100% limerick. Um, and it, it's the, the, the examples I'll be using would be mostly limerick, but um, the, the problem with doing a talk specifically on limerick sources is that it would be just this and that and the other and the next. There are reasons for that that I'm going to talk about, why, why um, Irish family history sources are fragmented in, the, in that sort of way. Um, the best I can do is direct you to um, Mike's website, limerickcity.ie, library, local studies. Um, there's a, a, you can see that there's a, an extraordinary mix and gather of sources, newspapers, um, gravestone inscriptions, graveyard records, estate records, um, extracts from uh, biographies, uh, trade directories, it's, there's loads there, okay? And it's all searchable uh, via uh, a Google search box on the site itself. So um, that's, that's my excuse for not talking about Limerick specifically. But Okay, the, what, the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, I, I like to get this out of the way early on, um, this is the, the, the single most important, important um, the single most significant fact in Irish, not just family history research, in Irish history research of any description, is what happened in 1922, when the, the, the Public Record Office, which was part of the four, four courts complex in the centre of Dublin, um, was destroyed at the, the outbreak of the Civil War. Okay, there's, there's still, this is, these are, are just two of my many mor morbid photographs of burning records. This is like one of, I have a, a collection of them. Um, there's still, uh, whose fault was it? Okay, this is the first question of most Irish arguments. Um, um, thanks very much, Mike. Um, until recently, I would have... Uh, I would have um, blamed the occupiers, the, 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 the anti-treaty forces inside the four courts. But if, if I read a, a book recently by, edited by Ernie O'Malley's son. Ernie O'Malley was the commandant of the, or the, one of the commandants of the, the forces inside the, the four courts. Um, and by far the most literate and interesting writer to come out of the whole Civil War and um, War of Independence period. And he, he, he wrote two um, wonderful memoirs on another man's wound and the singing flame and mentioned not a word about the fact that he was there when they, the, you know, the, the, um, uh, who was responsible. But his son has recently edited a book um, which includes a, a long examination of how the stories about the destruction of the public record office have evolved in Irish history. And it's very, it, it certainly opened my eyes to the, the unspoken prejudices that I was carrying around. Um, the, the, so it, it's fine, it's not a good idea to store gel at night in the public record office treasury. It's also not a good idea to be lobbing artillery shells at it. But anyway, enough said. What was lost? Um, everything that was in the treasury, in this wonderfully carefully constructed to be impregnable um, record store. From the point of view of genealogy, the important things, by far the most important things are the, the censuses. Ireland was the first place in the United Kingdom, as it was then, to actually hold com full censuses. Okay, A census giving the list of everybody in the household, their ages and so on. Um, from 1821, right every 10 years, right up to um, 1911. Um, the, the ones that were in the public record office were 1821, 31, 41 and 51. 98% of them were destroyed. And that's an, uh, an absolutely irreparable loss. That's a black hole in family history that will never be filled. Um, but there are lots of other things that are gone as well. The, the Church of Ireland had been uh, the state church until 1870. So its pre-1870 records were deemed to be state records. So they look... Church of Ireland was obliged to deposit them in the public record office, and any of them that were there were destroyed. So um, again, a huge loss if you have Church of Ireland ancestors. There were deeds going back to the 12th century, court records to the 13th, military records from the 18th century on, transportation records, wills going right back to the 16th century, um, huge, the, the massive land transfers that took place 
in the 17th century that completely changed the nature of the country. All of these records just erased. Okay? So, that's it. We can all go home. Um, okay. The important point to dwell on, okay, the, the glass is about a third full, maybe not a half full. Um, what wasn't in the, in the PRO? And this, this is the focus of what I'm going to be talking about this evening. The, these are universally relevant sources. If you're doing family history research in Ireland, these are the sources you're going to have to be using. 1901 and 1911 censuses, which hadn't made it to the public record office. The general register office records, the records of births, marriages and deaths, which weren't in the public record office non-Church of Ireland church records, and then property records from the early 19th century, Griffith's valuation especially. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, the, the Irish family history research deals much more in fragments than family history research in most other countries. And this is the reason, because of what happened in 1922. It means as well that uh, the difference, the dividing line between local history and genealogy is much blurrier in Ireland than it is in most other places. Um, very often you will end, you'll start out doing genealogy and end up doing local history. Um, so they, they, you also end up with what you might call second order sources. These are things that are not obviously um, important. Things like the Tithe the Plotment books, these early 19th century records, which would be footnotes in most other countries, but are the only comprehensive things from the 1830s, or near comprehensive things from the 1830s for most areas. So they've acquired a natural importance. So the, the, the effect, 1922 has had all sorts of ripple effects on what is and isn't important and how they can be used. What I'm gonna do is, is go through the major sources. Um, and I, I'm sure most of you here have done something at least on uh, some research. I'll be talking mainly about online records because one of the effects, one of the facts of life now is that it's not actually possible to do family history research without using the internet, that's it. There, the, e, a lot of the records that were, even were available in the National Archives have been withdrawn and they'll direct you to the, the online version that they have there in the, in the access to in the reading room. So it, I hope that I will be able to show you a few things that you hadn't thought about or spark a few new ideas about, about familiar sources. Okay. What's now possible? Um, when I talk about the internet, um, I th think back to when I started doing research in the, the 1980s, uh, God help me, and the, uh, the extraordinary change that has happened. Okay, Whereas then, we were peeping through keyholes and uh, you know, knitting with boxing gloves and fumbling in the dark. Um, the lights have been turned on. The, a revolution has happened, and it's mostly happened in the last five or six years. What it means is that for a large majority of Irish people, it is possible to go back to the 1850s um, fairly painlessly, mostly for free. Um, that's... It, as long as you, well, okay, it, it is, I never thought I'd be able to say that, okay? A lucky minority can go back another generation or two, also almost all quick and free. And those who are steeped in luck or have property, they're synonyms, okay? Um, they, property leaves records from earlier generations, so with property you can go back further. But it does depend on property almost always to go back before then. So anyway, um, I'm going to try and show you what's now possible. 1901 and 1911. They, they, this is a 1901 form. Um, for the rest of what was then the United Kingdom, these forms were destroyed for 1901. So Ireland is the only one that, for, for which there are the originals. Um, I'm sure most of you have looked at it at this stage, that there are uh, a few things to be kept in mind. First of all, the, the, there is an original signature here, which is something that, that uh, can be worth a lot. There, there is a real visceral connection between these forms and your family. Okay? I remember my grandfather died when I was two, uh, when I finally found his 1911 census return and saw a signature for the first time, it was a dead ringer for my own. You know, and you, you get 
that that kind of absolutely visceral connection with the records from the 1901-1911. Um, they're also uh, okay. The one thing they give you the name, the occupation, the religion. Again, that's specifically Irish. You won't find that in Welsh census returns or Scottish census returns. Um, our religion was always a, a, a very important thing to be quantified in this country. But you have religion, education, age, um, occupation, marital status. And in 1901, 1911, you have here a very complicated question revolving around married women, the number of children who have been born alive to them, and the number of children still living. So obviously the statistics, people were interested in child mortality. And it was only supposed to be filled out by married women, not by widows, not by husbands, only married women. So you'll see, for example, here, um, you have um, nine children born, seven still living, and it's crossed out because uh, he is a widower. Okay? This man, um, Mr. Flood. So, uh, the, all sorts of information was collected um, incidentally. Obviously, this is gold dust for um, genealogy. You count the number of children here, you count the number of children living, okay, you know, you have three people not there at the time, where are they? Away you go. And that's one of the things they, they one of the ways of thinking about records like this is that they provide you with strings to pull, okay, with threads to pull, to follow up. They're also, the way they're digitized um, on the National Archives uh, website is pretty extraordinary and pretty special. Um, there are copies, they've licensed copies to uh, the commercial websites Ancestry.com and FindMyPast.ie but this site is the only place where you will get this, the more search options. What they've done is made every single item on the return searchable. So for example, here you are, you can search by the census year, the townland, the county, the religion, the literacy, occupation, you can mix and match all of those. This is a screenshot of uh, how I found my grandfather's um, 1911 census return. Um, he, he wasn't turning up, so I said, show me all, all people with starting GR, first name John, aged more or less 28, who was born in County Roscommon. Okay, and it returned lots of John Greens, and it returned a John Grenham, which was a mistranscription of my, my grandfather. So, because you can mix and match them, um, you can leverage any information you already have to find out more. And that's the entire process of genealogical research is using what you know or what you find out in some place like this to find out more. Um, it's also one of the things that uh, I don't think. Uh, the site gets enough credit for is just how useful it can be in, in terms of local history as well. If you want to find out every blacksmith in County Limerick who was deaf, away you go. There you are, no problem. Um, you know, if you want to find out, if you want to find out, uh, compare the cohorts. You know, the particular ages over the generations. What ages did they usually go deaf at? Um, here you are. You know. It, it's uh, uh, an absolute gold mine, and it's completely addictive. Um, you know, this is one of these classic family history sources where you, you start off and you say, I'll just look at something at half nine, and you're there at three o'clock in the morning, still <laughs> goggle-eyed. Um, and there's all sorts of wonderful things. I mean, for example, under religion, there's a wonderful list of religions. Um, and then at the bottom, there is other. And I thought to myself, other? They've listed everything here. I know what else is going to be. So search other. And what popped up? was from 1911 particularly, lots of feminists had filled in religion as suffragette. Okay? And very often, interestingly, on the same form, they put in as um, uh, specified illness, lack of ability to vote. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they, you, once you go into these things, you begin to get a flavor of the, the individuals behind them. And you need to play with them. They're, 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 they're well worth playing with. Um, there's there's a, a, a famous one, a man in Dublin, who recorded his dog um, as unable to read and write. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, I'm involved in uh, correcting the transcriptions at the moment. And one of the things I do to keep myself sane is collect some of the more weirder mistranscriptions. I thought I'd share some with you. 
This is, there, there were about a hundred of these, sisters of the Mr. Suline order. There, there was a, a railway porker, no porter. There's a, a long lost 19th century occupation. <laughs> He's um, a piano tuner, obviously. Um, grand boy, no, errand boy. And this is my favorite, is, is somebody, uh, the, uh, a 22 year old woman had under occupation just horse transcribed. And I looked at the original, it was nurse. Nurse. And this is, you, you look at this and you begin to think, maybe somebody is taking the mickey here. I mean, <laughs> they can't be actually doing this deliberately. That, that looks a little bit malicious, though. It, it, it should read, or see uh, priest, uh, parish priest, or see. Okay? Completely different to an Irish priest, or I see. Farmer and flasher. <laughs> Flesher, I think it should be. And the hawker of Irish. Um, you know, and he, would you like a hawk and eel? No, no, it, it's fish, it should be. Uh, again, you. The, one of the things, there's, there's a serious side to actually pointing these out to you. People do, people who haven't been exposed to as much of this stuff as I have, tend to think of what they see as transcribed as gospel. And it's not. Um, the people who transcribed the, the, the census corrections were Canadian. Um, a lot of them, I think French is their first language. A lot of them was a very peculiar worldview, and I think a very strange idea of what early 20th century Ireland was like. Um, but it means you always look at the original, where there is an original, and that's now the gold standard in research. You have a transcript, you have an original, don't trust the transcript, look at the original. Okay? Um, uh, there are some, some uh, mistakes that I, I just love. This is, when I come to the very end of my correcting work, this is the last one that's going to be corrected. This is, you can't read it up there, it's, it's McNeil. This is Owen McNeil um, in 1901, and he's recorded as the secretary of the Garlic League. <laughs> and, and, um, I say to myself, if, if only, if only, if only, but one, it's, he's there. Search for garlic in the occupation box, and uh, you see what comes up. There are, there are other um, employees of the Garlic League there as well. Okay. Um, Moving swiftly on, the General Register Office records. Again, these weren't in the, the public record of 1922. They are wonderful, and they are wonderfully available. They record, in theory at least, all births, deaths, and marriages from 1864, and all non-Catholic marriages from 1845. Um, they, it's worth knowing how the records were collected because there are three separate kinds of records produced, not just births, births, deaths, and marriages, there are three different levels. So the, the, the basic, the large scale structure within which the records were collected was the poor law union. So they were union based, and they still are. I mean, this is one of the things, if you're wondering about the, uh, the traces of the, the poor law on modern Ireland, um, the superintendent registrar's union for birth, registration of births, deaths, and marriages are still, outside the, the, the cities at least, are still based on the old poor law unions. Um, so there were 163 of those, and then they were subdivided into local registration districts. Okay? The way the actual process worked was the local registrar had a, a volume uh, for births and deaths. The marriages were slightly different, but uh, we won't get into that, that level of detail. But they, they, um, once they reached the end of a book, once it was full, they passed it to their superior, who was the superintendent registrar in the poor law, in the, the, the town that was at the center of the, the poor law union. Um, he made a copy of that um, quarterly, every three months, and sent the, every three months sent the copies up to the registrar general in Dublin. The registrar general in Dublin then indexed those copies and made the indexes available for research. So let me just show you a, a nice little graphic that I put together to, to demonstrate this. You have the local registrar who records the events for his district. He passes the completed registrars up the pyramid to the superintendent. The superintendent holds the completed registrars, has copies made, sends the copies to the registrar general, and the registrar general then makes a, 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 an index covering the entire island of Ireland um, based on those copies. That means that there are Local registrars still held by the superintendent registrar here. There are the copies 
which went to the Registrar General, which are still, uh, they're in Roscommon now, which is at the headquarters of the, the, the Registrar General. And you have the indexes created uh, uh, based on those copies. So you have three records. You have the, the local ones, you have the copies, and you have the index. And bits, not, no, there's no single place where you'll get all of those, but there are nearly all of most of them in different places online, and nearly all free. Okay? Um, just to show you, the, these are the, the poor law unions, and these are the superintendent registrar's districts. It's not very clear there, but they, they, one of the points that I, I tend to beat people over the head with is that the poor law unions didn't respect parishes or county boundaries. They were based on um, economic hinterlands of rural market towns. So, for example, Kilmallock um, in South Limerick has a, a good part of the union is across the border in Cork. Um, this, the, the most notorious one, of course, is, is Waterford. It, it takes in a good sway the South Kilkenny. So if you're looking in the indexes, the indexes will tell you what superintendent registrar's district or poor law union um, an event happened in. So for lots of South Kilkenny, they appear in the indexes under Waterford. For lots of the, the Charleville area, for example, in, in Cork, they'll appear as Kilmallock. So apparently they're in the limit, but they're not. So it's one of the things you need to, to be aware of. This is something I've done on my own website. This is um, from Kilmallock. Um, I don't know if you can make out the places. They are, this is a complete list of all the, the places recorded in Kilmallock Poor Law Union, or Superintendent Registrar's District. Um, and you can see the county. There's Limerick, 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 and then Cork. And the Cork ones are in this local registrar's district of Charleville. And here you can click on that and you can get down to the, the list of the, the places in Charleville. And you can see even in the Charleville registration district, some of them are across the border. Effin and Kilquain parishes, there are parts of them in Charleville registration district. So it's one of the peculiarities of the registration system that people find that people get tripped up by regularly. So I, I, um, I like to point it out. Um, these are the records. These are the centralised copies made and made in this case in Kilmallock Union. Um, it was the book, the Registrar's District of Charleville. Just to show you, I wasn't lying. It's the counties of Limerick and Cork, and you get the date of birth. You get the name of the child. N note, if any, again, this is one of the peculiarities of the system. It was obligatory to register a birth, but it wasn't obligatory to register a child's name. And in places where there were um, lying in hospitals, um, very often an entire ward would be registered by the matron, and she just put in the surnames. That's it. So the, the child might be John or Patrick or Michael or Bridget. Um, and already given the name by the children, but they'll appear in the, the indexes as just Murphy, brackets, male, okay? The, that's not a, a, the, as big a, a stumbling block as it used to be because these things are now uh, browsable online. But anyway, it, it tells you um, the father's name, the father's address, the mother's name, the mother's maiden name, his occupation, um, who registered it, and when it was registered, okay? So it, again, the, the meat and potatoes of genealogy. The death records, there was no obligation to actually register any family information at all in a death record. So you, all you get is the date and place of death, the name and surname, the sex, the marital status, the profession, the uh, cause of death and the, the, the registrar. So because there was no obligation to register a family, uh, any family information in this, unlike, I mean, Scotland, for example, has wonderful death records. They give you um, parents' names, they give you all sorts of wonderful things, and people get very disappointed. But because they're nearly all available online, and browsable online, it's always worth looking at them. Because, I mean, in this case, for example, this is in Shannon Golden. Okay, Shannon Golden registrar's district in the Poor Law Union of Glynn, and you have, this is the death in 1885 of Mary Ganey. Okay, female, spinster, three and a half years, daughter of a shoemaker. Okay, hydrocephalus. Okay, and the person who registered it is John Ganey, father, present at death. So you actually do, even though there is no obligation to register uh, family information, very often the death records do contain them. 
more often than not, a family member of some description will, will register the death and give the, 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 the family connection. So you have, I mean, it, it, one of the things about these records as well is that they, they are very poignant. Um, they, anyway, um, by far the most useful of the three of them are the marriage records. They give the names of the parties, the ages, not always precise, but whether or not over 21 usually, marital status, occupation, address of time of marriage, father's names, father's occupations, and witnesses. Okay, and again, you can see obviously here you have half a generation on each side. You have enough information in the marriage record that can take you back, in this case, for example, they 25 and 20. So they start registering births in 1864. So, um, Bridget McGrath here was born about 1854. You know her father was Andrew, so you, now you're looking for a baptism of a Bridget McGrath, daughter of an Andrew McGrath, about 1850. Okay, so it, it's it's again the record provides you with the thread that you 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 can pull to to get further. Um, those are the records. This is until about three or four years ago, four or five years ago. This was the only route of access to the records. You remember I mentioned that the Registrar General collected all these, these registers centrally and then indexed them. So this is what the index looks like. This is for 1866 births. You get the surname, the forename, the registration district, and that's the poor law union. So you're looking at, if, if somebody was born in Charleville, you'd be looking at Kilmallock for this. If they were born in South Kilkenny, you could very well be looking at Waterford here the volume and the page number, and that's it. That was the only part of the system that was publicly available. You had to buy a, a copy of the uh, a printout or a photocopy of the, the, the register to, to get any further information. That's all changed now, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But it's still, um, for particular events, it's still necessary to, to, to use this. Very, pretty rare. And this is the place, this is the only place they're available. This is the General Register Office Record uh, Research Room in Dublin. It's between St. Patrick's Cathedral here and the Christchurch up here. Um, it looks like the, um, an invitation to a mugging. But, but it's, it's actually, it's the, it's the old, um, anybody who knows Dublin, this is the old Weirberg Street Labour Exchange. The first precast concrete building in Ireland. Um, with a, a preservation order on it. Now the OPW have gone to town, it's a wonderful place inside. Um, I remember it, visiting it briefly for other purposes in the 1980s and it wasn't nearly as glamorous then, I can tell you, but it's there. It's open to the public. Part of the, the rationale behind connecting these records is that people are entitled to inspect them to make sure they're accurate. And this is the, using the, the indexes I've shown you, this is the, the place you can do it. Now, online. Um, there are four basic sources. Two from the central copies, those are the copies held by the Registrar General, um, and two from the local registrar's copies, the ones that stayed with the superintendent registrars locally. So just to go through them, um, irishgenealogy.ie is by far the biggest uh, collection of these. This is it's a free website, one by the Department of Arts, Heritage and the Gaeltacht. Um, it doesn't have everything, and it doesn't have everything in a, a search-free, search-friendly format, but it's, it's absolutely indispensable. Findmypast.ie have started transcribing the images that are on irishgenealogy.ie, and they're free to search once you register it, which costs nothing. So that, that, it's not finished yet, but it will eventually be very useful. Familysearch.org, um, this is the website of the Mormon Church. Um, a quick, uh, a quick uh, lesson in Mormon theology. Part of the, the, the belief, of, belief of the church is in the, the extended family and the notion that the family extends into the afterlife. And part of the religious duty of every member of the church is to do family history research and in effect invite their, their ancestors to join the, the church um, posthumously. Which, and because it's, it, it's a religious obligation taken very seriously, so the, one of the things the Mormons have been doing, uh, they stopped now because microfilm is more or less obsolete, but from the invention of microfilm, they went out and offered record holders a free copy of a microfilm of their records in return for being able to keep a copy in their library in Salt Lake City. Um, 
they did that with the, the general register offices, both in Dublin and in Belfast, because after 1922 there was a separate system in Belfast, obviously. Um, and they, they have microfilm copies of all of the indexes up to 1958, 